You are getting ready to listen to the voice of Dr. Radi Ferguson. 2004 Olympian. Four-time national judo champion. Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Author, speaker, and coach. Hey, what's going on, man? This is Dr. Radi Ferguson, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Radi. Um, I'm trying to set my phone up here. Without having this uh, gangsta lead. And I was just having a conversation, man, with somebody. And instead of just making this a one-off conversation, I figured, let me just share it with everybody. There was, um, there are three pivotal points, points uh, in my athletic career where things happen that shape the way that I think, that I govern myself, and that I, how I handle myself. Um, athletically, no matter if it's in the, in the, not even athletically, but in life. Um, the first one happened, I think it was my, either my first senior year or my junior year in college when I was playing football at Howard University. And I sat down in the office with Steve Wilson. They, they had, they did these, uh, grading sheets where they kind of graded you out to see what type of football player you were and, you know, your hustle and your attitude and all those things. Uh, you know, your speed, your power, your blocking, your catching, like this, just regular great, you know, just got to get graded out as a football player. And I sat down in his office and nothing on my grading sheet was bad, but when it all got added up together and you did the tally and you ran the percentage, came out about somewhere around 80%, 82%, something like that. And I don't even think Coach Wilson, Wilson remembered. I, 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 I 100% believe that he never remembers this conversation. But he said a remarkable line to me that that changed the way that I prepare from that day on. He said, hey, Fer, we can't win with you. And then he repeated himself. And then he said, we can't win a championship with you. And I never really, you know, I had, you know, you come out of high school you're all world you get to i get the college man i was starting running back i was playing two three sports at the time i was decent didn't do everything right um i was a decent athlete but i never had a coach tell me up front which most people don't hey we can't win with you on the field meaning we're gonna have to find somebody else it was my it was my junior year okay because my, that junior year, man, I didn't play a lot. I played, I got pulled from my starting position. And the reason was, was because I didn't do the preparatory work in the summer to be able to perform at the level at which they needed me at that time. And as you advance in college, they need, they, they need more of you and they expect more of you. And as the expectations increase, your preparation and your work all those things have to increase. And nobody's having that conversation with you in college. They're just gonna sit your butt down and put somebody else in the game. And if you can't if you can't pick up the rest of that stuff through having great friends, great coaches, great mentors, other people on your team who are striving for a championship too, and having a culture of winning, you you you're stuck. And that's why that's why winning programs beget winning, because the culture of the place has an expectation of winning. It's just really different. And that conversation really changed how I prepare because by the time, and this is what I got from it, by the time Coach Wilson gave me that information, it was too late for me. Like people think you can switch gears. No, by the time he told me that, his assessment was was based upon the work that I had done previously and the season was getting ready to start. And that was it. The second time was when and I graduated from college and I'm training and I'm training with uh, training with Jimmy Pedro. And I'm at the Olympic Training Center but just years later. And I go to, I did two stints at the Olympic Training Center. This is my first stint at the Olympic Training Center. I go train with Jimmy Pedro because Jimmy's 1999 world champion, 1998 winner of the Shiriki Cup, 
the best judo player pound for pound on the planet in 1998. Without a doubt, there was no world championship in 1998. The best pound for pound judo player on the I think he went like 84 and three. Like some crazy, is it 84 and three or 83 and four? Like some crazy record um, that year. And as I've done in my MMA career, when I started MMA, I went out, Rashad Evans was the number one guy in the world. I went out and trained with Rashad to see where I was. My dad used to always tell me, man, find out who's the best in the field and go train with that person so you can see where you're at or listen or sit down or talk or read or watch whoever's the best at what you're trying to do. So I asked Jimmy if I can go to Massachusetts and train with him. No problem. It was me, Jimmy Pedro, and Orlando Fuentes. Now, there's a point in your athletic career where you accept that you have to do the work. You just you just accept it. I have to do the work. I have to be miserable. I got to do the work. I got to be miserable. I got to embrace the grind. I got to embrace the discomfort. I got to bathe in discomfort. I got to I got to I got to jump into the hot lava. I got to I got to I got to got to you you just you accept it. But then once you accept that, you don't really know what you're accepting. It's like when you sit there and you get married, you say to having to hold from this day forward to death do a part, to death do a part. And you talk about in good times and bad times and sickness and health and as long as we both, you sit down and you make that vow or to the thing, to the marriage, or you marry yourself to excellence or you marry yourself to your career or you marry yourself to being able to be the best you can in physics or math or science or MMA or judo or jujitsu. Like you marry yourself to that thing. And then when the thing gets tough, when the requirements of what it is to be that good are known to you, then you dip, then you run, then you divorce yourself from the thing because it's too hard and you're concerned with being happy. I went to train with Jimmy Pedro Help me today, Holy Ghost. I thought that I knew what world-class training was. I had no clue. The workout for Jimmy was a regular workout. I, I The only reason why I completed the workout is because something that Jimmy did in seven minutes, he finished it in like one circuit in seven minutes and one in six and a half, seven minutes. It took me 16 minutes to finish. We had one circuit where we had to go up the steps and do the circuit upstairs and then come downstairs. And I thought they had gotten downstairs so fast, I thought they took the elevator downstairs. So I was waiting on, they said, what took you so long? I said, I was waiting on the elevator. They said, you were waiting on the elevator. We ran down the steps. They, in my mind, I could not fathom going down those steps after doing like, there was like the, the amount of single leg squats that we had to do inside of the circuit was so ridiculous. Um, that I said, there's no way that they ran down the steps and they laugh at me to this day because I took the elevator down during the circuit. But what I received was a really good idea of, and you, and I learned this from also, well, it, it got stapled down when I learned also by Grant Cardone in his book, 10 X, whatever you believe the work is that's necessary in order to be what it is that you want to be 10 times that amount of work. And then 10 times that. And that is what it takes. It, whatever you think it takes, you have no clue. None. That's why it's so difficult to have discussions about, with, I, I call them normies. You know what I mean? I, the normies, the people in the general population that are trying to tell me about the Shikari Richardson conversation or they're trying to tell me about world class. And even when you look at MMA, some of those people aren't, they're not world-class, world-class. Some are world-class and some aren't. When you have people who have, have worked at a world-class level like like Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier went to the Olympics with me. I'm 46 years old. Daniel Cormier went to the Olympics with me in 2004. He leaves, retires, and then becomes the UFC heavyweight champ and light heavyweight champ. Or Ronda Rousey fights all her life in judo, retires, comes over, and then wins everything. Like, there's a level of professionalism that MMA is beginning to access, but the pool of athletes are very different. Like there's not a great deal of athletic talent and depth in MMA. This is why somebody like Kayla Harrison can move over to MMA and just shoot to the top. And now we're talking about her and Amanda Nunes because there's nobody else to talk about because there's a different level of profession. You don't, you can't fathom 
in your mind what Kayla Harris's training regimen was like. It is beyond your comprehension. Her MMA training now is easier physically on her because she has more learning to do. Whereas when she was in judo, she, she was at her cap in terms of learning and everything was tactics, strategy, strength and conditioning. You know, it, it was just totally different, man. And until you really, I'm not talking about no, I ain't talking about no CrossFit workout. I ain't talking about what you think is hard. All that, I ain't talking about what you watching on the YouTube video. Every hard workout that has ever existed is not on video. You've never seen Usain Bolt workout. You've never seen Carl Lewis work out. You've never been inside of an Iowa wrestling practice. You've never been inside of a Greco-Roman practice at the Olympic training center when they're doing a 60-minute grind. The words that you would hear in there, you would not like. You would not like the vomit that you see or the projectile that's going in that gray bin in there. You wouldn't like the, you wouldn't like the smell of the place. You've never seen Matt Lindland and TC Dantzler throw each other on their head and neck like they don't like each other with Matt Lindland's wife and children sitting on the side of the mat. I was in the, I used to go watch Greco-Roman wrestling practice because I need to see what the world class, I used to watch Matt Gafari and Randy Couture who are friends try to beat each other up like they don't like each other. And if you don't, You have not lived until you have a friend that you love who you you get upset with because they're not trying to make you draw blood during the round. You start getting upset with them because they're not pushing you past the point of regular discomfort. Like I got a friend um Jason He's a Greco-Roman wrestler. He does a lot of work with the guys on American Top Team. He just hit me about two weeks ago. He said, uh, he said, man, I need to come up there, man. We need to get together, man. We need a 60-minute grind. I'm sick, man, I don't want to do that. I said, man, I said, man, I, I, don't, I don't want to do a 60-minute grind, man. And like he basically, I'm not going to, what he, let me paraphrase it because this is one of my clean coffee rides. He, he was basically saying, hey, man, stop talking negative. Stop being weak. Access who you're supposed to be and let me know when we're going to do this 60-minute grind. Let me tell you, and this guy weighs, he's about maybe 60 pounds less than me. But the, the mental vacation that I need to take in my mind in order to do that 60-minute grind with him is not somewhere I want to go. It's, it's, in my mind, it's not the Cayman Islands. It's a slum somewhere in Bosnia. All right, it's not what I want. It's a it's a war zone in in Palestine, Israel. I don't want to go to that place in my mind, but that's why I got to go because he doesn't start out the sixty minute grind slow. He starts out the sixty minute grind like it's a three minute sprint, and then he keeps that pace until he can't hold it anymore, and he waits until you break. And then when you when you start to break, then he pours the hot lava on you. You got to make a decision about your life. And when you think you, you when you think you want to leave, or you think you want to get, there's no water in the ground. There's none of that. If you have to pee, you need to pee on yourself. You need to keep going, and we'll just deal with it. And that's how it goes. But you have to get to a point where you understand that whatever, however hard I thought this was going to be, there's going to be ten times that and then 10 times that, and then be willing to go to that, pace and splay, that, that space and place. The next person I learned from was a guy by the name of Lord Irvin. I remember we were training, I was doing my master's degree from 2000 to 2002 at Howard University, and I had one training partner during that time. Lord was the only training partner I had. We trained in the mornings, and then we trained, we trained in the mornings, um, strength and conditioning, then we trained in the midday, and then at night we trained. We did we did technical training like grips in the middle of the day. And then at night we'd roll like hard, hard. I remember we were rolling. 
changed my whole perspective. I said, ah, oh, I got to stop for a second. He said, what's the problem? I said, man, I caught a cramp. He says, man, I've been cramping the whole round. He said, you can't stop because you cramp. Now, all my life to that point, you know, you run in track, you cramp, you stop, you feel like cramp, you stop, you cramp. I thought when you catch a little cramp or something, you got to stop. Because it, a cramp hurts, it tightens up. Tight. It wasn't until then, and I started studying bodybuilding and stuff like that. I didn't know that those guys, when they're on stage, they're cramping while they're posing. I had no clue. I didn't know that you can, when you're doing hamstring curls and you feel your muscle getting ready to cramp, it can cramp and you can keep going. I didn't know that. Because it's, there's, there's levels to this stuff. Like you squatting, man, you squatting a set of 20s, 20s, 30s, your, your leg is cramping, your back is cramping. It, it cramps. It's not a pull. It's not a strain. It's a cramp. You can keep going. And I had no clue. But when I started training later on and doing marathon, when you do a marathon, you cramp. You cramp at mile 18. You cramp at mile 22. You cramp at mile 16. You cramp and you finish. You just cramp. I mean, it's... Like now when the guys in the dojo catch a cramp, they say, oh, I, I caught a cramp. I say, well, is it is it muscular or is it menstrual? I said, let me know. So I get you some my dog, we go to work. I mean, it's, let, let me know. What's, let me know. Man, you're going to catch a cramp. Your forearms are going to cramp. Your fingers cramp. Every, your toes cramp. I caught a cramp in my foot. Well, keep going. Press your foot against their bicep and get your toes back and keep going. We, we're not stopping because you got a cramp. But I didn't know until Lloyd said it that day, changed my changed my whole perspective for my career on then about cramping and rolling, cramping and lifting, cramping and running, cramping and doing judo. Cramp I wasn't aware that when you start increasing your pace and you start working your way out of whatever reserves you have, you start working, your, you start sweating more than the water that you have available you start working more than the salt that you have available, the potassium that you have available, man, you're going to start cramping. And there's no way to get that stuff in while you're doing the round. So what do you do? Because you might cramp at the world championships. You might cramp at the Olympic trials. You might cramp at the national. What do you do? What do you do? In all these situations, I had to learn that, man, life is not going to be ideal, ideal but you're going to have to create the ideal situation from that which you have. In 2001, I was in. I went to Brazil uh, with Lloyd for the World Championships, and there was some traffic. It was me, Lloyd, and Leo Dollar, and uh, I think you know Melvin, Melvin Yates, and we're we're in the parking lot. And we're running to the venue, trying to get to the venue. And when I get there, I hear Haji Ferguson, last call. I walked into the venue, it was last call. I didn't stretch, I didn't warm up, I didn't take the nervous pee and boo boo, I didn't do any of that stuff. This is exactly what I said. And, th and this is the key for a lot of people because a lot of people have an adverse situation and the first thing they do is they go negative instead of instead of taking that situation and creating a, a, um, a bed of positivity. I looked at Lord and I said, man, we got to go down here and get this first match in, get this warm up and get into the second round. He said, that's right, that's right, baby, that's right. That's how he talks. He said, that's right, that's right. I went down there, fought the match, one in the second round. Man, I fought, I forget all the dudes I fought that day, but I know I fought um the dude that uh Chel Sonnen's BJJ coach. I fought him that day. I also competed against Rafael Lovato that day. And I beat both of those dudes. I was in the finals against Ken Lagu and I lost by a decision. Let me let me be clear. Okay. I tell I tell people this story all the time. I tell people this story all the time when I beat Rafael Lovato. Listen. 
Rafael Lavato, not not a, not no play play thing, but real. Rafael Lavato had a real like his foot was broken, broken. Like I don't, he couldn't walk. He was on crutches. He hobbled out to the line, one leg grabs. Like his foot was broken, broken. I couldn't pass his guard, and I only won by an advantage. And his foot was broken. I am not. I am. An, I am. I am not in the same league as Rafael Lavato. I am not comparing myself to Rafael Lavato. I understand the order of things in the jiu-jitsu world. I've been humbled by enough people to to know where I'm at. I'm decent and I'm good and I'm I, I, I ain't bad. I'm not Rafael Lovato. So did I win the match that day? Yes. I need to change my verbiage. I didn't beat Rafael Lovato. I won the match, respectfully. Okay. Um. But Chell Sinus coach, I I beat him. <laughs> But we were all we were all purple belts at the time, and I played second in the world at the uh, at the world championships in the purple belt division, and second in the Pan Ams in the purple belt division, and I lost both by both finals by um, referee's decision. Jiu Jitsu was really crazy back then. It was very very difficult to very very difficult to be an American and win in in the finals. Really tough. Um, but what I want to say. when bad things happen, I learned through sport that you can't be a hero without the adversity. Like, there's fourth, listen, there's fourth and one to get the first down in football. Then there's fourth and goal. And then there's fourth and and one with a minute 30 on the clock. And if we don't get the first down, we don't keep the ball. And then there's first and goal with no time on the clock. Excuse me, fourth and goal with no time on the clock. All those things are fourth and one, fourth and inches, fourth and goal, all of them. But the one that's going to put you on the on the front page of the newspaper of the day, the one that's going to be the story that people talk about at the dinner table for the rest of your life is the fourth and goal or the fourth and one on the goal line with no time left. That's the one that's uncomfortable. That's the one that has the most pressure. That's the one that some people run towards and that's some one that some people run away from. Some people want the ball then, some people don't want it. Some people want it for the wrong reasons. Cause let me tell you something. When you're playing against the big dogs, they know who's getting the ball. They know what side you're running behind. The the linemen know on both sides. The linebacker knows. The running back knows. The full everybody, the quarterback, they all know. And, and the question is, have you bathed in enough hot lava to the point where that situation doesn't heat you up? Because if the situation heats you up, the situation is going to eat you up. Because any time in life, and you've heard me say it before, any time in life where you are overwhelmed, it's because you are underprepared. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations in the weight room. Put yourself in uncomfortable conversations when you're talking. Don't don't bypass the uncomfortable conversation. Have it respectfully. Sit down and say, hey, man, hey, uh, sir, hey, miss. So I like to sit up, set up an appointment to talk with you. What do you want to talk about? I like to talk about that situation that happened the other day. We don't have anything to talk about. Yes, we do have something to talk about because we need to clear the air on some things. And I don't want to run from the situation. I like to meet the situation head on. And I like to find some time for us to talk. Well, I don't want to talk about it. That's okay if you don't want to talk about it. Are you willing to listen? And if they're not willing to listen, try to talk first. Me favor, put it into an email. But do not run from difficult conversations because they're difficult. Don't run from the extra five. Man, I used to be um, training with Lloyd, and I put the weight on the bar on the squat, and he'd look at on his side, and he'd go grab a 10 or, or 25, and he'd put a 25 and a 10 on his side. And what the hell are you doing? I didn't understand until later, if you're lifting 
at that particular time in my career and you didn't look at the weight and start to have a conversation with yourself, then the weight wasn't heavy enough. After you've warmed up, if you're looking at that weight and the weight don't, don't don't give you a little bit of discomfort, like I need to be really concentrating on on on, on taking this bar off the rack, taking one step back and not two, dropping down, standing back up, not off weight. I, I, because if I'm not paying attention, I'm going to get hurt. Not that it's so heavy that you can't do it, but it's heavy enough that it requires all of your attention all of your focus and it's a little bit uncomfortable man people riding the airdyne bike in my facility as soon as it gets hard as soon as their legs are burning they start slowing down no you got to change your mind as soon as it gets hard and as soon as it starts burning speed up run into the fire it's a different mentality and people don't realize when those things happen, you're not training yourself for the next bike ride or the next thing. You're training yourself for life. And you do not want to get in a situation like I was in, in my junior year in college, when Coach Wilson sat down with me and he said, Ferguson, we can't win with you. Because he told me that based upon the work that I had not done. And if I knew better, I would do better. But at, at that time, I did not know. You now know. Make the adjustment, make the change. Anytime you're in a rough, rough situation, a rough, rough, rough spot, you got to find something to hold on to. My thing is Jesus don't know what yours is, but there's going to be times in your life where whatever you're doing is more than what you can physically handle. And you're going to have to lean on something else emotionally and spiritually. Sometimes that's friends. Sometimes it's training partners. Sometimes you're going to be in the gym all by yourself with nobody else around. You're going to have to find somebody else to lean on. And your, your iPod and your phone is going to go out. There's not going to be any music available. And you're going to have to find something else to lean on when you are not enough. I'd encourage you to try God. If not, man, try something else. But you're going to have to get something. Because the situation in life is going to get such that it's going to be or feel like it's overwhelming. And the one person who I know who is not underprepared for anything is Jesus Christ. So when I get, when it gets tough and there's a lot of weight on life's bar, I know I got somebody who can spot me where I can get up out the hole when it gets tight. But that's what I use. Whatever you want to use, you use. I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's my deal. Get you a deal. You might want to use that deal or get you a deal. But whatever the, whatever the situation is, you don't want to get in a spot where you found out that you are not prepared. You want to understand that in the preparation process, it's going to be 10 times what you thought and then 10 times that. And then you need to understand the pain is going to be overwhelming and the discomfort is going to be overwhelming. And that is not a reason to stop. Man, this is Dr. Ferguson. I love you, but God loves you best. Take care, man. Have a super fantastic day. And please visit www.coffeewithrodi.com and get the book Coffee with Rodney today.